I find really at the end of the day, my best A and R is my manager. That whatever song he plays when he's in the meeting in the car, like whatever record he gravitates towards the most, that's probably my best one. <laughs> Jordan, what's happening? Who we got lined up today? Yo, what's up, Sam? Today we have artist and decorated songwriter Mark E. Basie. So for those who don't know, uh, Mark E. Basie has collaborated as a songwriter with Kehlani, YG, Ty Dolla Sign, Charlie Puth, g Easy, and a bunch of other artists, but he's also an artist himself. He's 5 million monthly listeners on Spotify. I first discovered Mark actually when I was uh, interning for his publicist at the time at Audible Treats. Um, so I've, I've, I've gotten to know his career pretty intimately as a, as a fan, as somebody who's helped support it in the very beginning of my career. And it's definitely a full circle moment to get him on the podcast today for me. Um, you know, a couple of things that I'm really excited about for everyone to hear is, you know, we obviously, this is the music business podcast. We interview managers, people at labels, publicists. Um, but Mark is, is one of the first artists of his stature that we've actually interviewed on the podcast. So in addition to covering the, the artist side of uh, the music business and how to think like a business person as an artist, um, we also get into his growth, his creative growth as an artist, and what people can learn from it. So I think there's a there's a lot on, on both sides of the aisle, both as a as a business set and business person and as a creative that, that people can learn from today. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, no, I thought it was incredible. Like you mentioned, I mean he's it's just cool. Like we've had so many people from the industry on this on the show. So to really just dive into the entrepreneurial and business side of uh thriving and growing as an artist was really awesome. I, I think the best artists treat their, I mean, there's the artistic expression, there's creating great music. And like we say multiple times in the podcast, you can't discount that. We talk even with him about his, his evolution sonically as an artist, how he's been able to refine his actual core product. Right. But beyond that, like the best artists are also very focused with their business. They're putting great teams in place. They have very solid goal setting structures. Some are really playing this kind of CEO role and really overseeing and, and managing their team and involved in various pockets of their business. So it's really understand and get his perspective on how he's been able to build a lot of the traction he has in his career is really valuable. And I think it'll be super valuable for all of you. So really excited to have you guys tuning in. Um, and without any further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Marky Basie. Mark, how's it going, man? Thanks for virtually coming out to the Music Business Podcast. What's good, man? Thanks you. Uh, it's good. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, have finally met you. I actually, um, in 2015, interned for the publicity company that you hired at the time. So I've I've, oh. ri I've written wow. some of your um, some of your press releases as an intern <laughs> in 2015. So <laughs> yeah, East East Hollywood days. <laughs> so, so those were really good days. Yeah, man. I mean, that, that, um, you know, I always tell people that the people always ask me what I think about certain albums and I feel like I have to give them time because the best albums and the best EPs and best songs are the ones that were, were that I listened to during like significant moments of my life, not necessarily the records that were the best, but the ones that stuck out in my life the most. And in East Hollywood, 2015, that was the first year I ever got paid to like do music. So, um, wow. yeah, yeah, man, so. <laughs> yeah, tight. Hey. Yeah. Um, so I guess just to get started, you know, what do you, what do you think are, are, are two or three values that you attribute to see your success so far today? Um, well, um, number one has to be for sure. hundred percent certainty is persistence. Um, I just, I've never even thought about doing anything else. This has been my entire life really since I was, 17 18 like i just made this weird choice in my head and there's definitely been a couple times in the you know a decade of being in music that i wanted to give up but i never have um for whatever reason it's been like just compulsory like not not like i was ever even sat down and contemplated quitting i was just so persistence um community like my my friends and the people that I make music with uh, and the people I work with are a huge driving force in my life and watching them uh, grow. And it's that that aspect is actually really, really difficult because to, you know, to stay in a, a working but also social relationship with people, you know, for more than three or four years, it gets really difficult because real life happens and, you know, um, 
you just you get tight and it's almost like a family and you know a lot of people even with their family tend to like drift away it's like you still love each other but you don't necessarily right. see your siblings every day and work with them you know so and i would say uh i think for me there's just a uh, number three would probably be like just the actual love for writing and performing um and just you know it, i'm reminded fairly consistently of how much i actually love what i do um when it's clicking and it's not all the time uh it's not every day i still like i i belabor in in music you know and working and sometimes it is like right. it, it does turn into a job just like anything you know i don't want to go to the studio i don't get that same feeling like i used to every day like oh my god i'm gonna be in the studio i'm so excited and there's that electricity it's not like that every time but it's it happens often enough that i'm reminded so yeah maybe persistence community and just the love for the craft yeah i actually saw a meme earlier today that said um didn't want a nine to five job so now i'm a musician at work 24 <laughs> 7. that's true yeah that's awesome man i'm curious too because like when you think obviously there's the um the art and the expressive side of your career and just creating great music, music you love, um, and really just kind of the discovery process that goes along with that from writing to performing. Um, but then there is this kind of like business side and, and even business might sound like harsh, but there's like the, the networking and the collaborating side, all these other things outside of just making music that are, are critical to the success of, of your growth as an artist. Right. So when you, think about kind of even just like the team structure. I remember I was speaking with the manager that managed uh, a very, very successful artist. Um, and she effectively equated it to an artist being like the CEO and the, the manager being like a COO, really helping kind of coordinate. So there's kind of like the conductor and the team carrying things out. I'm curious from, from your perspective, when you think about all of the activities outside of just creating music, um, what, what have been the, how have you built a, a team around you and where do you see your role within that team beyond just making music? I think to begin with, it's different for different camps. Um, mm -hmm. But you notice the same personalities are within every camp that's successful. And usually there is a CEO, like you said, which in my camp, that would be me. Like at the end of the day, I pretty much am involved in everything. And I need to, I spend more time working on that than actually creating because the creating part for me is a, na a natural thing to me that I've learned how to just like when I'm actually, when it's time, I can go and I've set up an infrastructure around me. So like there's a studio in my house, there's a studio down the street, you know, that like every everything is ready for me when I feel like it's time to record. Um, but I spend a lot of time just like, you know, we have a merch business, we have a touring business, we do a YouTube series now. And I just, I stay, I don't stay on top of all the, um, like the scheduling and everything, but I'm in, I'm involved in everything. And then, but I, I think most successful camps also have like that great networker, someone who really is looking at where the next opportunities are going to be and what relationships they have to have. And, I think that's something like I've struggled with because I never really felt the need to like network too much. I always just liked my opportunities to come through people valuing my, you know, my, either my songwriting ability, like I guess songwriting was the b biggest way for me to network because I'll write for someone else and then I'll meet their writers and I'll get in the door in this great room through writing and then be like, Oh, check out my new, you know, this is my project. And then people get excited about me as an artist. And that's really how Marky Basie started. I was done with being an artist. I was, I'm just a songwriter. And then I was like working with Chris Brown, pitching him like an acoustic demo. And he was like, "This, who is this singing? I was like, this is me, bro. It's for you if you want to do it. And he was like, no, you should put this out. This is really good. And that was one of the first like joints that I put on SoundCloud that got traction. <laughs> so that was the networking aspect. But I guess to go back to your question, I see myself as a CEO and then I have my partner, I see sort of as like the CFO, which is the most important. So I, I really 
<laughs> it sounds crazy, but I, I really, I try to be involved in everything from a creative standpoint. And my partner stays involved mm -hmm. in everything from, from a financial standpoint. And I have like Supreme, we have real trust, which is a luxury that maybe a lot of other entrepreneurs and, you know, people in my situation might actually not have that. But we have, you know, because, you know, me and my partner, his name's Fess. Um, he, I met him through Knickknack. He was, we lived together for two years and then he was my tour manager and then he became my manager manager. Mm -hmm. And we just have ultimate, you know, trust in each other. So I don't really worry, you know, I got the business card, I got the personal card and I just go do whatever I have to do. And then he kind of shows me where we're at. And, but that's, that's kind of how we structured. Like one side is like the actual economics of the business. And the other side is like me trying to engage and have as much creative output as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, my favorite way. You know, you always see like this Kanye West shit about mm -hmm. like, Kanye lost the $300 million and you know, he's just out there creating, doing as much <laughs> as he possibly can and trying to make the boldest things happen, most expensive things. And someone probably comes in and is like, I'm sorry, but you cannot, <laughs> you, can't, you can't perform. Like I had a management group that I used to work with, worked with him on the watch the throne tour. And they were like, he came in and he wanted to bring, he wanted to perform <laughs> on top of a great white shark in an aquarium. <laughs> and, and they were literally like, he, they did it all for him. And they're like, this is how much it's going to cost. And they're like, you're going to lose like $40 million on this. <laughs> and Jay-Z was like, yeah, I'm not fucking doing that. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I try to, I try to take that approach and, and just be the, like the create, the creativity and the, you know, I try to be somewhat responsible, but then I have like, there's the yin to my yang on the other side, which is you know the CFO role. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, I love all that. When you think too, I mean, I, I feel like there's certain artists too that um, early on in their career discount a lot of the stuff outside of the creation process. They they feel like if you make great music, like magic will happen. You'll find an audience. Yeah, yeah, they'll come to you. Um, like, what do you think for, like, artists that are trying to, like, build up traction, get to a point? Like, we've even spoken with, like, right. Jordan, he likes to say, too, it's, like, sometimes there's, like, man uh, early stage artists that are, like, dying to find a manager, but they have nothing going on in their career. So from the manager's perspective, it's, like, man, you ain't even got nothing to manage yet. So from your perspective, like, early on in the career, outside of refining your craft and creating great music, which we can't dis like, we can't discount that at all. Outside of that, though, like, what are the other key areas of focus from your perspective to really begin mm -hmm. building traction? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think subconsciously, I was just business minded. I, in terms of like getting traction, I was only thinking about that. Like, even when I first started, it was like, you know, my senior year of high school, I was like, well, there's 10 battle of the bands in my county this year. And my band... We got to enter every single, like we won every single one, dude. That Where was, are you from, by the way? San Francisco, Bay Area. San Francisco. Oh, how I forget. I, I done yeah. wrote it. No, no where? <laughs> Copied and pasted that bio several times. I don't know how I forget. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but uh, I, I think it's really difficult right now because there's so many millions of people trying to be famous on the internet, uh, either, you know, singing you know, content creator, influencer, or whatever. So I could see how even being business minded right now, like if you're just trying to be an artist starting, it's like, it seems like we all know, like you have to somehow pop off on TikTok or, you know, your personality has to come through on the internet now, which is a little different than when I started. It was a little more, you have to have finished songs. They have to be, you know, distributed on these various places, then you need to like get a feature. Like a lot of mine early on was like other artists that were popular, trying to get in the room with them and, mm -hmm. and kind of going that way, just like knowing the right people. Now it seems even more like now, even if you were in the biggest room, I feel like someone would just be like, what are you, where are you at on social media? And mm -hmm. it, has, it has so much to do with it. But I, I think there are, for anyone starting, 
Um, I think when you have a team or even if it's just you in the beginning, like it was just me. Um, my manager was just my homie that I said, you're my manager in the beginning. Uh, he had never been in music or anything, but we did, we did practice like the fundamentals of any business. Like these are our goals. You know, I want to get X amount of plays on SoundCloud and I'm going to keep posting songs, you know, one song every two weeks. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have the nice artwork for all of them. You know, I would pick 20 or 30 more influential artists that I was going to send it to. And I kind of did that, like, no matter just without really thinking about it, but I had goals in mind. And I think when you <clears throat> when you follow that and you and you're intentional about specifically what you want, where you want to be at. I hate to say it, but like the universe, it opens up to you uh, in a way. And when you kind of demand that I am Marky Basie now, I'm an artist, I'm a songwriter slash artist. I have this album called Only the Poets. It's coming out this day. I had the artwork. I, you know, I charted out my rollout and it was just me and my homie. And we were like, we're going to make the trailer video for the EP. We're going to, you know, do these things. And we're gonna hire. We we hired Audible Treats. Is that the company that you were with? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the company we, I was interning for. <laughs> yeah, we we hired Audible Treats, and I didn't even know that that existed at the time. But that was an example of like, I heard about like, oh, PR firms like mm. help for artists. So I did all that with nothing going on, no one checking for me, and it just started to like work a little bit. And I think it was just by, you know, I claimed what I was. This is my company. At the time, it was called EO Music. Um, That's named after my mom's company. But it was just the intention was completely there, and the direction, the rollout was there. And I think now it would be this. It's the same thing. Like I'm gonna. This is when my project comes out. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna put it on Instagram. I'm gonna make this amount of TikTok videos to promote it. I'm gonna sing live. I'm gonna mm-hmm. make the music video. Everything will be promoted just like. Fucking Drake and Taylor Swift do. Only I have ten followers instead of you know, ten billion. So yeah, yeah. I, you just kind of got there is like a script. You know there is a blueprint, and it's easy to figure out what it is now because you you know a lot of people are talking about it. But you know, that's that. I really haven't done anything different than that, and I still do it to this day. And that's on, the most fun part of the process for us now is the rollout because that's like the music is done i'm just getting to that point right now too and then and the bigger you get and the more resources you have the more fun the rollout becomes because now like we just did a photo shoot yesterday where like i'm like on, on a horse like with a hawk on my arm <laughs> and all this <laughs> that sounds wild. like some kind of west shit <laughs> like we just you can do all this wild shit now the more right, resources right. you have but in the beginning it was like everything was just shot on the iphone in my house and just to watch that part grow right like, yeah deep it's funny you say that because um i used to be an artist like you know like every manager and label person was at some point and um people asked me why i wanted to switch into management which is what i did after i was an artist and i said it's because i was in love i was more in love with the rollout than i than i was with the record (laughs) like i had a really great time like coming up with the marketing ideas coming up with ways to pitch it to press all of those things i was really excited about and eventually i didn't want to do it myself for myself. I was like, man, I want to do this for other people too. So it's funny that you say that. Um, before we kind of get into the creative side of things, because I kind of want to, I kind of want to also dig into uh, your craft and, and how you've developed that as well. Um, what were some of your business influences that kind of gave you some of that, that mindset that you just spoke on? I know you said your, your mom has a business and I know you've been kind of surrounded by business people with business acumen kind of, you know, growing up, but what, what were some of your influences and kind of what did you learn from them? I mean, there's really like, my entire family, I'm, I'm not even uh, exaggerating. There is not one person in my family who has a job. Like everyone, mm-hmm. my mom has a personal care products company called EO Products, mm-hmm. which became really successful like after I left home. But it's like a, my mom, it's a big company. She's like 230 employees. Like it's a, mm-hmm. city, like it's a manufacturing business. And my two aunties, one owns a, pizzeria and one owns a sandwich shop in San Francisco. And I grew up with those three women mm-hmm. and my uncle. And then I have an uncle who also owns a, a smaller, but also successful personal care products company. He used to work with my mom and they had a falling out and he made a rival company. <laughs> so I've just always been around people that were hustling for themselves. And 
never had money, like always like just, you know, cash flow, like getting enough to get through. And that's the other thing I really picked up on is like my business. I'm just now finally starting to like put money over here away from my business, which mm-hmm. I think is really important as an artist after you get over like maybe one or two of the first humps, like, but starting out, it was like, there was no difference. Me and my business was one entity and Marky Basie, you know, Marky Basie touring company, which is like my business on paper. That's where the money goes. And it's the same thing. Like there is no money that I ever had that wasn't going to be put into my art, into my, into the promotion of my business. And I saw my mom do that my whole life. So that just seemed natural to me. Like, there would there it has never been me and like oh i need to put money aside or save anything for myself everything has been about my career and at any point you know i'm i would be cal- i would calculate but i would be willing to most likely risk it all you know to get to that next step in my in my process and i think that's something you internalize from your parents uh and from your family like some parents are not like that at all and they're you know uh, very risk averse and you internalize that and i think in that way i just always been like i can go all out i know i can Mm -hmm. because no one in my family would ever like look down on that that's what we do right i've never had that fear in the back of my head i've always been like oh i can just i can go for broke every time if i want and i can even like even now sometimes i'm like even if i like I was recently in Mexico and there was all these really good bar bands. And I was like, I, I could quit everything and start a new band <laughs> like in Mexico from like all these good musicians and every I would do it all over again. Like just uh-huh. even this process, you know, it like turns me on. Like it's just, I, I love it. So right. I just never, I, I think those influences, Tamil Pie, Hazel's Kitchen, EO Products and Griffin Remedy. <laughs> Nice. For businesses that I was just raised around, um, and then obviously there's like watching a uh, like the way Chance the Rapper did it, the way um, I mean I would say like Drake, but his was like the cosign was such a big part of his climb. But wa- like watching TDE, I was around TDE when I was you know when like Kendrick and Schoolboy Q and Mixed by Ali and uh, so like they all lived in one house together you know and like i've i've seen a lot of teams build up um so that was always inspiring to me too um and for us our build up was like a collection of songwriters more than like a label and then it kind of we've morphed it into a label in the past two years mm-hmm. so now i'm more influenced now i'm starting to actually really look at independent labels and how they actually work um and so that's like you know you know who also is like kind of the go weirdly is Macklemore. Macklemore mm. was my, was my homie, and the way he like really that was like big time community like right. everyone around him. He knew his whole time growing up, and he just picked out you know the most talent from his city and his circle and just blew it all the way up. I think people underestimate like how successful that man is. Right, right, yeah, it's a special man. When when you think too, like I do want to um, play to the the artistic side, and not I know you said we didn't want to like discount that, but I do think the same element of growth and focused goals. I'm, I'm sure in, in one way, shape, or form is manifested in your evolution as an artist, and and you're just that kind of as you continue to level up sonically, creatively. Can you talk a little bit about your your kind of journey of growth? Um, from the kind of creative output perspective with your own music and performances and, and what's really enabled you to actually continue to grow there? I think one of the blessings of being able to get a little, like, I hate to like talk about age and shit, but be a little older is like the humility that you get. Cause when you're really young, you just really think you're better than you are. No matter what anyone says, like that energy I had when I was like 22 and I would go into a session I couldn't even hear what was worse about my music. I was just so excited that I thought whatever I was doing was excellent. Mm -hmm. And as I get older and I listen to more music and I see what makes songs successful, the biggest thing that stuck with me is like vibrations. Like music is really vibrational energy exchange. 
and realizing like for me my my gift has always been lyrics and melody and so mm. i just thought if my lyric and melody is great my song is great and i completely overlooked how good records actually can sound and you know how like if you give if there's space in the production the voice comes out better and if you bring your breath through you know the whole line of a song like you got to really sing songs in the perfect key for you because you're competing for the best top top spot and when you listen to the biggest artists their records just sound incredible in every single way the mix sounds incredible the vocal production is incredible there's no missed words or lines like and i was in the beginning i just thought i was i was so excited about like the expression and the songs themselves that i overlooked a lot of the sonic qualities and that's really what i focused on the past two albums is being independent it's harder to make like they have tricks on major labels to shut you down that they don't really talk about but i know like when you go to spotify the way that they ingest when you're on a major label i mean this is a conspiracy theory but i've had to fight to even get my songs as loud as they're supposed to be on spotify versus when i was on a major like i don't know if there's actually like a difference in how they input things but some of that stuff is like that's like what the fight is to me now is like the growth sonically and making sure my songs slap just as hard as the weekend and and like right. paying, paying attention actually to mixing and mastering and to vocal production and i was really like uh non-technical in the beginning and then like i finally i learned how to produce my own vocals to record myself i just kind of got more uh, immersed myself in the technical art of recording music and that's been a really fun journey also like mixing everything on the board now we do that and mm. just you know paying attention to my mic chain and paying attention to like what drum sounds i like all that um adding that to my arsenal was the most you know probably one of the most fun aspects of the past few years right right that's super dope that's super dope speaking of kind of like you know spreading your creative wings um, you've had a lot of like high profile collaborations over the years too. So um, obviously as a songwriter, your motivations for collaborations are a little bit different than when you are the artist yourself, when you're the performer yourself. So at this point in the game, how do you approach collaborations? Is it, is it, is it spontaneous? Is it, Oh, someone's in town. Let's get in the studio is it strategic. You know, there's this artist that has really good, who, who, a producer that makes really good bass, uh, you know, drum rolls and, I want that on my record or kind of how do you approach it and kind of how do you let those collaborations, um, I guess, improve your creativity? Well, I mean, the best way anyone will tell you is to go artist to artist. Artist to artist is the best way to get a feature, a real collaboration. It's really rare that a manager is going to reach out to another manager. Mm -hmm. and they're going to have a convo. And then when your manager tells you that you got to get on a song, you're not going to do it for months. You know, mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. No matter what, it's just. But when you're actually talking to the artist, so all of my collaborations were like personal friendships, or I was in the studio with someone and we just cooked it up and did it. Um, it's really hard to go through like the business side of it, and I think you see that at the highest level too. Like when Drake needs a feature or whoever, they're gonna text that artist themselves. They're not gonna make it like a weird dance my people hit your people thing <laughs> um so i try to do that um if i'm being honest i felt like features are so important right now because of streaming and that mm -hmm. kind of bothers me it's become such a tool to increase streams because if it's the artist spotlight track for the other artists you know then you're gonna get more exposure on the record and if they put on their release radar and there's all these things that are there's all these new ways in which a feature is beneficial more than just like did he make the song better did they make the song better so that kind of bothers me a little bit i've actually been more apprehensive and like a little more because i can just feel on the business side everyone around me is like we need to, who's gonna where the features like we bounced my entire new album with open second verses like mm. that's how far we went mm. without even, without even really thinking about it, just to mm. see like, 
what it would cost. And then they come back and they're like, well, Lil Dark is 50 bands, and but he likes this song. And then it's just like that. that so I kind of have a love-hate thing with it right now. <laughs> because like I don't want to just whore out my music so that it gets more streams necessarily. But there is, it is important to, you know, to collaborate and to kind of show the world like this is, you know, it's almost like just a new a, a new way to like add texture to your album. Like if I come out with an album and I have, you know, uh, Lucky Day and Sid the Kid on it, it's going to be over here, my album, just because the features that you saw. And if, if it has a little dark on it and Moray and, you know, whoever, like some more like urban rapper or, you know then the, the album's gonna be more over here and this and that's gonna change how it gets playlisted so you definitely you gotta think about it um and be specific about like what the features are really bringing to the table but i try to just make it about the song as much as possible and block all that other stuff out of right. my head I, I think it's just turned into such a a thing now because of how uh how much it can contribute to like the streaming and the awareness of the record right so I guess kind of on the flip side of that, um, what does a successful collaboration look like? What is it? What does it look and feel like? What is the what's the creativity in the room feel like? What kind of what in an ideal world, uh, you know, well, what, is the, a, what does a great collaboration look like? The biggest song for my last project was called uh, Just My Luck. And it has like 50 million streams, the independent, you know, on Spotify, just one song is pretty good for me. Mm -hmm. And it was with Black Bear, and I like posted a clip of the song when I made it. He hit me up like, "Yo, this sounds fire! What song is this?" It sounded like me and Black Bear at the time kind of had like the same fans, like what you know that that style. Like we were had the same uh, listeners who listen to you. Also listen to you know on Spotify, you can see who your listeners also are listening to. Um. So I was like, hey, you want to get on it? Send it to him. We started talking about it, texting. He got on the record within 48 hours, sent it back. We shot the video. He didn't charge me any money. It was just like, I like the record. It was no like, you know, I just had to pay for him to be straight, like into the video and everything and like hair and makeup or whatever. But right. that was it. It was like, you're, that's my homie. We've known each other for five years and it was completely organic. No, no one spoke except me and him mm -hmm. until after everything was done and the record was out. So I think that's, you want to keep it as natural as possible. Um, and then I, but I do think it's good too to like shoot big shots. If you think like I have a new record that is huge, 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 my biggest record I've ever wrote. And it's, it's coming out this year and I'm trying to get like a complete A list huge feature on it and it's a long shot but i'm also going to try to do that just in case um because you never know that could change your life too right right that's Dope. amazing well i guess one of the last questions we have is with regards to management i mean i feel like a great manager is probably one of the most like important elements of your team is they kind of are the conductors of all the other entities the agents the labels all, all these different moving pieces oftentimes will report back to the manager um, from your perspective, like what makes for a great manager and are there any tips or, uh, kind of takeaways from your own personal experiences as to how you've gone about or how, how an artist can find an incredible manager? We've actually spoken to a lot of managers about what makes a successful partnership between a manager and an artist, but not as much with artists, yeah. um, as to what makes a successful partnership from their perspective. I mean, I, I think it really is. It It's about how well the two personalities are compatible, how compatible they are. I don't think there's like a one size uh, fits all approach, but it's just, I think it's about finding a person that, you know, he's strong where you're weak, she's strong where you're weak mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. Um, so to me, um, I knew that I'm a driven human being. I'm going to go get it. And like, I'm, I'm not going to have a problem. I'm not going to need someone like pushing, me. you know, I mm -hmm. need someone to, when I push too far to be kind of behind me, making sure I don't go to veer off course too much mm -hmm. and making sure I don't like blow my money. That was like really, a big, <laughs> like, bro, that was a huge thing for me. Like I would be 
like fuck it let's get east west studios i need to have like a full band and a choir for 30 days straight and they're like oh, well that's like two hundred thousand dollars mark are you sure you want to do that on your independent label just to do four songs so i needed someone that just really um was compatible with me and then i i, I do think uh i think one thing that like you need to appreciate each other kind of like in any relationship like i just had a talk with a big artist that I've, you know, that I work with sometimes like the other day and he, we were talking about how he's like, I don't even think my managers think I'm any good. Like they never Oof. tell me I'm, I'm good. You know, like we just talk about what we have to do, what we have to do, but never do I get the like, and I get, you know, in, in our relationship, I, I feel like we try to remind each other of like the positive, the positive qualities and try to like, give each other some sort of appreciation because you do want to feel up when people are managing you, especially and you're like a temperamental, moody, sensitive artist. I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit, which every artist is a manager needs to like remind you that, you know, you you're worthy of it. Not too much. You don't want to have like a yes man. Like you're the champ all, all the time, but definitely <laughs> you need to carve out, you know, some way to you, you the fucking man, Mark. Yeah, I don't need all that, but I need like oh, that record. That record was hard, bro. Like, yeah. oh, I like that one. Like, you know, you have to. I think some managers just forget mm-hmm. and don't don't even listen to their artists' music anymore, and they just like listen to thirty seconds and see do they think it's a hit and send it to this A and R, and they're just like they, they remove themselves from like the the artist being in it, and like that's at least for me, I like knowing that like my manager is listening to my music he has his own opinions about it he's really like involved and he's yeah. not he's not telling me what to do but he's really listening to what i do mm-hmm. um i think that's really important when you get too separate then you just turn into like you could be managing anybody there's no more like real since like when when the manager removes himself too far from the creative process it's like then he it's like he works for the label almost mm-hmm. um, damn which, you know, like artists never like their label people. That's just, <laughs> right. It's just a rule. Like, I don't know why. Just, <laughs> but somehow, like, like, when you're on a major label, like you might like one person. But if you ask any artist, they're never like excited about the person the label sent to them. That's just how it is. <laughs> no offense. Like, if you know. But, right. Right. That, that's not, that's not, you know, there's obviously exceptions to that rule. But. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're a little bit more removed, a lot of those people, because they do have a ton of different artists. You know what I mean? So it's a uh, it's a little bit less intertwined business like. But I think it's um I think it's interesting that you bring up you, your your manager listening to your music and how that artist didn't feel like their manager even knew if they thought they were good or not. I think one of the funniest things I got out of management pretty recently, um, about a year ago, and uh, I still listen to like every artist I ever worked with, like religiously. <laughs> and and um, I always wondered because you never really know when you're when you're working with artists. Like, am I listening to this music because I like really fuck with the music, or also because I like work with this artist so much that I also just listen to the music and I'm kind of like drinking my own Kool Aid, you know? But it was like super. It was like super awesome for me to feel like, oh, it's been a year and I'm still listening to all my all my artists. <laughs> like, I still believe in all my artists. I still think all of my artists are really success- going to be really successful. You know what I mean? Well, that's, and what's crazy is I find really at the end of the day, my best A&R is my manager and he mm-hmm. would never tell me he, he doesn't like to be involved in that side. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't like critique my music ever, mm-hmm. but I know like it's our career is so important to him that whatever song he plays when he's in the meeting or when, even if we're like fucked up coming back from a party and it's five in the morning and someone's just playing some shit, you know, in the in the car, like whatever record he gravitates towards the most, that's probably my best one. (laughs) And like this, in this latest for this new project that we're putting out, like there was this one I had that I was like, that's not me. I hate this record. I'm not doing it. And he just kept playing it. He didn't tell me like, you gotta, you gotta go with this. He was, he was, I thought it was, I thought I was corny at first. He's like, bro, I mean, it's not, I'm just telling you, like, I don't think it was, I don't think it was corny. I I like, I like how you came up. And I went, I thought it kind of fits you. I think you're you're being a little too harsh on the mm-hmm. corny. I'm like, okay, maybe. And now it's like, damn, that might be my favorite song I ever made. <laughs> so it took me a while, but he just really subtly was like, 
guiding me that mm-hmm. way. So, you know, it's that that comes from knowing each other, you know, and just being like having having being actually tight as human beings. But like right. I said, one of my really good friends, uh, I have a couple of manager friends, too, you know, and like some of them that uh, my homie manages party next door. I could say this is not bad or, you know, and he's like party just I just make sure he's straight, whatever he wants. That's mm-hmm. it. You know, he's mm-hmm. a genius. Like if he wants to go like to Mount Everest and record an EP, like I'm going to figure out how to get him there and just follow the vision and make sure he has what he needs. And that's it. I just stay out the way. I don't tell him anything about his music. I just do what he says. And, you know, right. I've been rocking six years and he's parties like in terms of singer songwriter, probably top five of the past. Right. Decade. Like, right. Can't be better than him. So, yeah. Right. That's dope. That's dope. Well, thanks, man. Um, you know, Sam and I really appreciate you being on the podcast. We know it's been a long time coming in terms of the scheduling and everything, but we're really glad that we were able to finally lock it in. Me too. Um, we, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff I think people will be able to grab from this. You know, we were coming with questions. We were coming up with questions before the interview. And um, I was like, Sam, there's so many questions that we could ask because we don't, we haven't, we, we, we haven't, uh, one, I know your career, obviously, and I have for, for a while because, I, did, I you know, I, I have since 2015, but Two, you know, we're we're finally at this point in the podcast diving into the artist perspective of things because we've been so business heavy, and um, you were one of the first people to let us do that. So really appreciate you uh, coming on. Thank you, man. Appreciate you guys. It was fun. Absolutely. All right, All right man. Thank you, bro. All right, brother. Talk soon. Yo, man, I thought that was a super impressive episode. Um, you know, it's been a long time coming for us. We've been trying to schedule that one for a while, and. It did not disappoint. Um, I think that hearing the perspective of an artist finally on this podcast um, and with Mark, who is just so open about his career and, and where he's gotten to where, how he's gotten to where he is today. Um, I think it was, I think there's a lot to learn from, from it, you know, um, kind of talking about his relationship with his manager was a highlight for me um, and just kind of how his manager and him are, are kind of always on one wavelength and how his manager is his best a and I, th- I think we hear a lot about people's relationships with their managers and how they defer from artist to artist and from manager to manager. And, and theirs is definitely an interesting one that has obviously paid dividends for them. So, um, yeah, great episode. What'd you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was great. I think uh, very well spoken, very strategic and thoughtful. And I think it's just going to continue on uh, the, the upward trajectory. So I'm really excited to see uh, what's in store and what's coming up in the coming months and years. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate each and every one of y'all. And we'll be back next week. Peace.